Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the House of Hardcore podcast, Tommy Dreamer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the House of Hardcore podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Dreamer. And this week, I don't have a guest. I figured I'm going to go solo here uh, just for a few reasons. Number one, I went solo on Busted Open uh, the past week. And then that's when uh, my good friend, the Iron Sheik, had passed away. So I figured if I could talk for three hours uh, by myself, I could talk for at least 30 to 40 minutes. And just there are a few things I want to just touch upon. Um, I got three, three on my agenda for today. Number one is the Iron Sheik. Uh, man, we lost a wrestling legend and a cultural icon. Uh, just being when that hit me on the air, <clears throat> it, uh, man, it was different. Um, I've handled a lot of when my friends or people I know pass away and how to talk about them um, right away. I remember when Road Warrior Animal had passed, the news had just broken like, probably 20 minutes before I had to go on the air. <clears throat> it was hard. Um, and I broke down several times with Sheik passing. Um, it was while I was interviewing Jessica Havoc for Busted Open, as well as being on, you know, Impact Wrestling and just promoting the up and coming pay-per-view. And then, you know, real life kicks in. And it was like, you know, uh, when you're doing these, if you've ever done, you know, of course, we've all been involved in Zoom meetings. I get in the chat, like while I'm doing the interview, like, hey, we got to go to break. And then I'm like, okay, wrap up the interview. I was like, and then right away, like, hey, we have breaking news. The Iron Sheik just passed away. We're trying to get guests. We're trying to do this. And I'm just like, whoa, like totally sitting because then I've just been told my friend has passed away. And um, I hadn't seen Sheik in a while. Sadly, we were going to have Sheik on Busted Open. I was supposed to interview him uh, for his A&E documentary. Um, and I hadn't seen Sheik in a long, long time. If I could tell you um, the Iron Sheik, I had to pick up Iron Sheik. And me and Taz had to drive the Iron Sheik. And I was a young wrestler. I could probably go to the good old book here and find it. But it was for a three-day loop, and uh, it started off like Massachusetts, then it went to like New Hampshire and Maine. It was for ICW with Savoldi's, and then it went morphed into a whole um, weekend of just pure next-level things I've you know never experienced, never seen. If if I could also tell you like that, I was that guy. I was the guy who picked guys up from the airport not only because I'm a straight up fan, but I wanted to learn from veterans that could sit in the car and teach me back then. I told you like our generation was different. You had people who were trying to break you for not being in wrestling and ride you and get you out of the wrestling business, as opposed to helping you. Um, Sheik was awesome. And like I said, I spent three days with him, which were beyond memorable. Uh, I told a lot of his stories for a book that uh, was supposed to be written by WWE by Keith Elliott Greenberg, and they deemed it too controversial for um, it to be written. Anyway, that was probably 1991. I don't see the Iron Sheik again in my entire career until 2005 slash six. That's a long, long time. Uh, and he remembered me. He, man, that made me feel so great. And I always took care 
of like the veterans when they would show up at WWE shows again, because you got to thank the men and women that helped pave the way for me to do something that I love, but also out of respect and being a fan. And, uh, but then when I was in the office, it was kind of my job. And for the fact that Sheik remembered me was one thing, man. And like, I just got to then share stories and always like sit with him. And, you know, he was a character. And like I said, a cultural icon, we know all the stuff, you know, that he did from the Howard Stern interviews and humbling. And I've just looked at like when he would pass, how many things were trending, like it was iron Sheik respect, humble, um, so many great things about the Iron Sheik. And if you do, like, it's when I do these shows, I'm talking like tribute shows, I, I do, I listen to all the guests and people that were close, and I'm piecing all these things together about kind of like how and when, like, things of his life where, you know, there's always definitive moments of like, you know, what happened why this turned out this way of your own life that you can see. Um, and just in his passing and through the stories, there was just uh, a lot of pieces, you know, put together and the amazing documentaries. I recommend everyone, you know, go out there and listen to the busted open podcast, watch his documentaries. Cause he was a, a great uh, professional wrestler. And, and a lot of people, my generation know what a great wrestler he was. And, but for a lot of people who are younger than me, they just know this crazy pro wrestler who just said whatever the hell he wanted to do to get a reaction. Um, even if you look at his last few tweets um, that were, it was, you know, F Hulk Hogan. He kept that to his uh, grave, but him and Hulk, you know, Jimmy Hart was on our show and Jimmy Hart was saying, you know, with, without Hulk Hogan, there would be no Iron Sheik. And without Iron Sheik, there would be no Hulk Hogan. They both told each other that at their uh, Hall of Fame induction. And, you know, it was even on one of the Howard Stern things, like when Sheik interrupted Hogan, you know, it was kind of a part of an entertaining show. And if you think about that, man, here was a guy, you could not do his gimmick today. It would be uh, canceled. It would. It, it just wouldn't be done. Um, we're currently with Russia and Ukraine having a war. If this was back in the day, you'd have a heel Russian character. You'd have a heel Ukrainian character. They'd be fighting all this personal conflict. But what Iron Sheik did uh, with his gimmick and during the time, I'm young enough or old enough to remember I was young when it happened, the Iranian hostage and, you know, killing soldiers, shooting down our Blackhawks. It was, you know, as big as 9-11 um, at the time. And all these people wanted to get our, our hostages, American people out of, a, uh, you know, Iran. They made movies of this. And here's a guy who was the embodiment of that. He was the Shah of Iran's legit bodyguard. He was the, uh, the face of of it. He had the, you know, he said he was sent here from the Ayatollah. He had the flag with the Ayatollah. He would spit on America. He did all this just to make us hate him, but yet he was such a lovable person. I don't know if this would, um, it, it wouldn't get over today. I say this all the time, um, just because of the political outcry and how dare someone play those characters, which is unfair to do. But this is the world that we live in, and we'll never see anyone like the Iron Sheik. But again, when I say I piece all these things together, Mark Henry talked about he was the, from he was trained by this famous um, bodyguard from his country. The I believe I don't remember the guy's name. I want to say it's like Muhammad something. And, and this guy trained you for to kill people. They didn't carry guns when they were protecting the Shah. They carried knives so they could disarm you uh, and that all came with you know respect and it's respect for the king they didn't uh use wep they didn't use guns to to fight each other this guy fought to the death when two kings would have arguments yeah hey, here's my best fighter you're a fighter they kill each other that means i get whatever i wanted because i'm the guy well that was the guy who was trained by sheik and it was all about respect and 
then it was, you know, I humble you because I'm, he's humbling you with his hands and hurting you. Then he was so good at what he did. He was brought to the United States and he was the main person who helped train Greco-Roman wrestlers, the first class of Greco-Roman wrestlers, because I learned this from Jerry Briscoe, because he was so good at what he does. And then he's over there in Minnesota, Vern Gagne meets him. The rest is history. Um, It's just, it's an amazing journey for this guy who was a legit badass, but also how the humbling process is I'm a legit badass, but then I have to be like, you know, have wrestled guys who aren't as good as me in this thing called wrestling. Also, I have to move away from my country when I don't speak the language. I mean, there's all these different things about him. For me, he was just an awesome individual to me. Always was. I have a million chic stories that I probably can't ever tell. So they're going to go with me to the grave unless uh, that book ever comes out that uh, Keith had said, but he was just he was my friend. And every time I saw him, he was uh, so, so awesome and respectful. Actually, I'll tell you one. <laughs> no, I won't tell that story. Damn it, Sheik. Uh, but I lost someone. And yes, he lived a great, amazing life. The other part of this, like when I was trying to say when I, I got the news, I was just like, I, I feel weird having to talk about that stuff um, in the sense of right off the bat, because I feel you lose the compassion level of losing someone. You're kind of like numb. And I don't want to feel that way. If you really do think about it, with Sheik, he was the first villain superhero or action figure that we all kind of had if it was from the LJNs, like he was the bad guy that we like wanted his action figure. And he was that face of bad guys. I mean, he was in the rock and wrestling connection and all that stuff, but we all have anyone who was an action figure collector, man, we had that, <clears throat> that face and, and Sam Roberts uh, brought it up when we did a podcast about action figures on busted open uh, of just this, he was the face of everything that was wrong, but yet you had to have him with the curved boots and everything, but with just an amazing worker, an icon and a friend. I hated the fact that I had to be on the air live for that, almost like a news reporter. And I was very, very, like I said, it, it, I don't like doing it, but it's, it was kind of my job that I had to do it. Um, the next day is fine because I'm able to grieve and mourn. I don't know how broadcasters like news broadcasters do it. I could never do that because it is so, so hard because not only do you have a connection, but I think we all had a connection. We all have a connection to professional wrestlers. Uh, For me, I was there when the Sheik in his greatest moment of his career, when he won the title, when he defeated Bob Backlund. Weirdly, I was just watching that match from that show. I was watching it on Peacock. And then like, you know, two days later, he's gone. So that's why I also say like, oh, we support, conventions and your favorite wrestlers or just go up and when you're there and you have the time to meet and greet them, you know, tell them how much you appreciated their work or like, again, thinking of the times we all think that back then wrestling is a hundred percent real. And this guy is sent from the most violent nation and the biggest, the pro the world's number one heel, Iran. And this guy is trying to hurt us. And like with all that stuff, He risked his life to perform each and every night and played the role of the bad guy when he wasn't the bad guy because everybody has a Sheik story. Um, So that's it for the Iron Sheik, and I'm going to miss you. And one day I hope to see you again perform up in heaven and putting a camel clutch on uh, everybody because you were an amazing performer. If you're a pro wrestler, I I will tell everyone to go back and watch his stuff, the simplest things that he did, uh, but... And not the older Iron Sheik. I'm talking about Iron Sheik in his prime. There was no better how he would take hip tosses, body slams, just like when he was getting his heat, like for his, he would step it up to that next level. I mean, I was also there when he won the tag team championships with Nikolai Volkov at WrestleMania and just like the heat and didn't care about it. And the times when he posed and the things that he did to garner such heat, Uh, lost art. And if you could pick up something, you could definitely pick up something from watching the Iron Sheik. 
Uh, two was, as you all know, I have uh, had a lot of stuff going on between my mom, all that stuff. Plus me, I know you're all looking at this and saying, what the hell is so shiny on your head? Are you going to town? Are you having barbed wire matches being crazy? No, guess what? Ladies and gentlemen, I had skin cancer. That's right. Being a Guido all these years has caught up to me. This is the second time. No, the third time I've had skin cancer. Um, and of course it's on my head, but I'm not a pretty boy anymore. I'm hardcore scary when they tell you, you have cancer and they have, you know, it's the best form of cancer but you have to get it removed for this. They're able to cut it out. It's called moles surgery. Uh, I've had it before. I've had it here on my chest. I've had it on my head. And now I have a bigger one on my head. What you're looking at is the grossness of 42 stitches. I had uh, 23 outside and 19 inside. You don't feel it when they're cutting you. The weird, they numb your whole head. The weirdness of it is um, there you have to cauterize your stuff so you can smell your skin burning. Um, and then the part that I didn't like, you can hear the scalpel cutting open your head. And the worst part is you can hear them when they're putting in the stitches. And it's a, it's a long task to get that many stitches, but it's in your head. They can numb it. You're not feeling it, but you can hear it. And it just feels and... You don't feel it, but you can hear it going into your skin and the tightening of the thread. It's gross. Um, I also learned if they pulled too tight, they have to do each one differently. And they kept on looking straight ahead at me because the tighter you pull, it could raise your eyebrows. Though me walking around with a people's eyebrow, hey, man, that could be pretty cool. But it's like giving yourself a bit of a facelift, which I definitely need, but not just on one side slash one eyebrow. Because if the doctor was like, if we pull too tight, your eyebrow is going to be raised. Um, anyway, uh, that's kind of why I took myself, uh, many reasons why I took myself off of TV, dealing with, you know, my mom. I never told my mom. Um, didn't want her to worry. I've known for about two months because of uh, almost three, because of the waiting time to get the surgery, you know, and I'm just like, man, like, you know, is this going to be bad? Thankfully, they got it all. And it has all worked out. I don't blame the sun. I do blame lack of sunscreen, uh, having a giant forehead. But most importantly, I do blame tanning beds. I used to go in tanning beds all the time. <clears throat> um, I could go down a whole other rabbit hole, but I'm not going to with vaccines and all that stuff because I do think differently, but I'm not going to uh, put that out there on this one. Um, but just because I've had this 10 years ago and all of a sudden had come back and uh, kind of same thing would happen with my mom, like her blood wasn't clotting. How come all of a sudden that happened? So, I mean, there's, I'm just not a very, very, COVID will, there'll be a whole bunch of other stuff that'll happen once you got vaccinated. Um, that'll be a whole other generation from, from now. But for me, uh, I had to deal with it. I got a new hole in my head. Uh, it's not healing the way I did. And just before I went on doing this podcast, which was Thursday, uh, June, I will look up the date here, June 15th. I noticed I could every time, like I, you know, put something on it, something, it would hurt. It's not supposed to hurt and uh, kind of like a pinch. So I'm nearsighted, which means, no, I'm farsighted. I can't see near. I have to put on cheaters to read or I just take my contacts out. Then I could see everything. And I see like, there's a piece of skin still hanging. I was like, man, like, and I try to wipe it off. No, I try to peel it. It's, Why is this piece of skin not coming off? Because it's a stitch. So I did a little surgery upon myself and removed one of the internal stitches that were supposed to dissolve. And then I just saw I have another one. So right after I do this podcast, I have to call the doctor and say, hey, should I remove this? Because I went to remove it and it actually hurt. So don't want to be bleeding internally, especially in my head, because then where's the blood go? It goes to either my brain or out my eyes. And that's gross unless it happens on television. Then I'm OK with it because I'm a crazy pro wrestler. Um, but when you're dealing with things uh, like that, I do keep it to myself. I don't want others to worry about me. I don't want, you know, that type of sympathy. 
I do just kind of keep on going. Whatever happens, happens. I get it taken care of. I am a man of faith. And thankfully, they got it all. And also when, uh, and I do, I talk to a lot of people uh, via social media. When they're going through this, you're not alone. We've all had it. And that's kind of why I'm sharing all this for you. When you hear these words, cancer, um, sickness, or you're uncertain about what's going on with you, we've all been there. Um, So sucks. It's taken care of. It's done for everyone who's now going to um, clickbait. Tommy Dreamer has cancer. It's skin cancer. No need to clickbait it. Just trying to help people relate and also take care of yourselves. Put on, it's the summertime, put on sunscreen and kind of maybe may stay away from those tanning beds. Back in the day, you could tan for two hours. That was called a double. Then it went to an hour. Then it went to 30 minutes. That's right, people. A young Tommy Dreamer would tan for two hours sometimes because they were told I could, but then the laws started changing. That's why we can't trust people with authority in these tanning bed polices, policemen or women, sorry, not polices. All right. Last uh, thing brought up is I saw Rob Van Dam talking about it in his podcast. I recommend everyone listening to his podcast. Uh, love me some RVD. And this was the anniversary this past week of a lot of ECW, WWE ECW moments. Uh, This was ECW 2005 was on June 12th. Man, just took me back, back in the day. I heard Rob talking. They hit me up with a lot of clips. And of course, it was an amazing day for me, but I I was just going to talk about the time leading up to it. I was in the office. Um, I wasn't really happy with that job. I learned a lot, though. I learned a lot from the other side because I was 34 years old and still wanted to wrestle and didn't felt I had more in the tank to offer WWE. Thankfully, I did uh, and was, you know, I was able to wrestle on weekends, do indies, but didn't want to go into the office when I went. I think I went in around 2004. 2005 and by 2006 we bring back ecw that's a whole other story same anniversary uh so it was the day after the, the following year that we're going forward uh wasn't too happy with my time in the office like i said because i just wanted to wrestle um and this comes about through rob van dam straight up rob van dam has this idea because he's like hey we have all these guys uh, under contract, the DVD did really, really good. It was off of the success of the rise and fall of ECW and Rob goes to Vince and pitches this idea about, um, you know, the reemergence of a one night pay-per-view. So I'm working in the office um, Two people who were a massive proponent for this. Vince just gave it the go ahead. Um, John Laurinaitis and Shane McMahon were very, very much like, Hey, we got to do this. I get called into Vince's office and he's like, Hey, we want you to do this. Uh, you're in charge. Uh, and it's going to be, we want it as authentic as authentic as possible. And I'm like, cool. Well, what about Paul? Paul at the time was not in the best favor with WWE, I know he's awesome with the bloodline and it's a hard to imagine that he wasn't, uh, he was not, I want to say he was either put out to pasture or at this point, he was put out to pasture before this. And then in a weird alternate timeline, which actually was reality, I was his boss in OVW after Jim Cornette was uh, let go and Paul was helping out down there because WWE was paying him. Um, So that was that. And at first Paul wasn't involved and I was like, Ooh, like how do I not do an ECW show without Paul? Anyway, um, it was just a weird time. Uh, So eventually I'm like, First, from a talent, I got to start getting all the talent that we have. We knew we had people under contract who wasn't under contract. TNA had people who were under contract. Rhino, 
I would have liked to have him, but he was under contract with TNA. That's when he threw the world title in the garbage and lit it on fire. Um, Shane Douglas was in TNA, I think as a producer, maybe as an on-air character. Then all of a sudden they're going to do this hardcore homecoming at the ECW arena. We're working in the Hammerstein. They're doing theirs the night before. There was so much behind the scenes drama. Um, anyway, got to sign people. People were signed to uh, two-day contracts. Leading up to it was just getting everybody get back together and putting the band back together was awesome. I remember like uh, closing my door in the office and I was, I was, I was happy, man. I was so, so happy. And then I remember closing the door and calling Beulah and being like, man, this is it. Like, I finally got it. Like, they're going to see this in me. I know what I'm going to produce. As Bully would say, I'm chasing the hug for all these years. And then uh, they finally saw it in me and I'm going to produce this pay-per-view. I'm going to write this pay-per-view and I'm going to uh, wrestle in this pay-per-view and they're going to see it. It's going to do great, man. This is like, this is everything I wanted. I'm going to be back full-time wrestling, working in the office. Life is going to be blessed. Uh, I had about a really good, I had a good little, maybe about month that time. And then to fast forward it to the year after I said the same exact thing. No, we're relaunching this. This is it. Like, yeah, this is going to be good. So uh, that one, I had about three months of that feeling. So, but again, life is about moments. I'm going to go back to 2005, right out the whole show. Everything is doing really, really well. I remember we had gotten Spike, a last minute addition. Oh, wait, no, Spike was, was Spike still there? I don't remember if Spike was still there. I'd have to double check that. But we got like uh, Tanaka. I'm going through my n notes here. Wait, we did get Rhino? Oh my gosh, we did get Rhino. How did that happen? Maybe Rhino had left there? I am so confused. Or Rhino was still there? Or was that for the second one? I really and truly don't remember that. I am very, very sorry in my inaccuracy on that one. Sabu was a free agent. He wasn't signed there. Van Dam was there. Fonzie was a free agent. Don't know if Rhino was still there. He probably was Benoit Guerrero were both there. Mike Awesome was there. Masato Tanaka was not there. Dudley's were there. They were kind of on hiatus. Sandman was not there. Lance Storm was there. Dormarie was there. Jericho was there. Super crazy was not there, but then he got a job there. Guido was there. Uh, man, I am just going down the list. Rey Mysterio was there. So was Psychosis. Anyway, um, put together the whole card. Wait a minute. I'm a little confused. We may have to pause this for a second. Why is Eric? Oh, Eric Bischoff is there. That's right. Um, I'm not confused anymore. Uh, that's what I get for looking at Wikipedia. Not everything on Wikipedia is true. Um, putting all everything together, man, it was just like everything was was just awesome. Uh, I'm bringing in Francine. I'm bringing in Beulah. Just incredible's there. We, we have everything set. I I had to have a private meeting with Vince. Get Vince on board. Say, hey, it has, if you want ECW authentic, it has to have Paul Heyman. Then we're incorporating the um, Outsiders, which was a thing. Uh, not the NWO Outsiders. Um, people who did not want this show to go off to go on you know within the company paul was brought on i want to say maybe two to three weeks i have all these i have dude i have a file of files i have emails i have everything um the printed formats good stuff uh paul adds the promo he cuts a match and, and makes it great i truly do miss at times and working with Paul because creatively him and I used to bounce ideas and like, we just knew what was right for that product at that time. Um, the show I knew was going to be amazing. Some of the hurdles that I had to deal with was one, getting all the wrestlers there and making sure everyone was on their best behavior. Because again, some people aren't under contract. Uh, the second part was music. I wanted you know, key musics to be had 
Uh, one was, of course, mine. The other one was Sandman's. Um, I'm trying to think of who the other ones was. I cannot remember. I was told no on one, maybe on mine, and probably not on uh, Sandman's. <clears throat> they said they were going to do it. I never got any email back responses. And then I got verbal, hey, we're working on it. That's all I could deal with. Um the day of the event, I have to hold a production meeting. The production meeting is upstairs. ECW, we never had production meetings, been in production meetings. I'm running the production meeting. I'm speaking in the production meeting. Uh, it's a job that Vince, you know, has or whoever ha the head writer is. Leading the thing, and at that moment where we're going over, probably the second match in, when I'm going over everything, and again, this is for uh, – just prospective agents who are just going to be on headset just in case. And then the proverbial fire marshal has to be there. We're wrestling in New York state fire marshal has to be there. And we have to go over what they like to call, which I hated a fire stunt. So I get the head over the, the loudspeaker. Hey, we got to do this now. It's a fire marshal is going to leave and he's not going to allow us to do this spot. So in a suit, I run down the steps, Hammerstein ballroom, bullies in the ring, bully and Devon show how much lighter fluid they go. This is exactly what he's going to do. He takes one little thing of life, which lights a little bit of a, a fire lights it up. Doesn't go as high because this is what we're going to do. They pick me up. They put me through the table in my suit. Boom. Fire marsh goes, okay. And I go, okay, we're good. Good. I have to run back upstairs on pure adrenaline because I was just kind of like set on fire, put through a table and have to go finish this production meeting in front of Vince McMahon. So go and do that. Vince just laughs. Uh, I have a great relationship with Vince or had a great relationship with Vince. I haven't really talked to him in a while. He's doing other things. He's busy um, with his billions. And uh, so Vince just like, and I was funny because everyone who was in the production meeting literally just watched what happened because they just came out on the balcony. It was either on the second or the third floor, watched me go through the table, and then I have to quickly go and do that thing. And Vince's like, oh, we said it's going to be different. Anyway, um, do the production meeting. The show was super duper happy about it. Uh, it's one of my greatest creative masterpieces. Love it. I could watch it. I felt it was um, as legit to the product it could be in just one night and that's what it was supposed to be a one night stand um when i will always say this if you want to see the my most genuine happiest as tommy dreamer the performer when I, we had no clues a, cl no, no clues a, no clue whose music was going to be played, whatever. Dudley's go out, no music, old school. Bubba brought out the tie dyes with Devon. Uh, my music hits, it's not Enter the Sandman. And I'm like, ugh. I mean, I'm, it's not Man in the Box. And I'm just like, ugh, it's my WWE music, whatever. Go out there, perform. I'm doing it, doing it. And like right before I go out there, Paul's like, he gives me like the look. He's like, we got it. We got it. And he's like, just listen, just listen. And right then and there, I know, because Paul and I were so in sync. If you ever want to see my happiness, and I even tell people, just wait for it, wait for it, because we're waiting for Sandman's music. Enter the Sandman hits. When that music hit, it was my go back, probably the happiest I've ever been in professional wrestling. Like, I have the most legitimate smile I've ever had, because, man, I was just like, this is all I wanted, man does his entrance the place is rocking all throughout we're drinking beer there was a lot of people who were sitting ringside if you go back and watch it there was people there who were booked but then their matches had gotten cut some stayed out there we just wanted to play pay homage and it really was just a payday for everyone that i could get paid at the time uh something and if wwe okayed it so it was a really, really cool moment. Uh, one of my happiest match goes now. Here's where everything goes. Sidebar. Um, Bully Ray hits me with the Singapore cane right in my ear. 
And I don't know if you've ever had a gunshot go off near you. I don't know if you've ever had trauma to your ear. When he hit, man, my equilibrium goes off. Besides it hurting, like you're instantly like you hear a whistle and it's a whistle in your head, not a whistle that's being, and it's just, it's like you're, I did go deaf, but I'm hearing this whistle from the shot of it. And now I'm also trying to get my bearings and I'm not knocked out. I'm just so messed up from this shot and everything is muffled. And if I could from the crowd and I'm going to cover my hands over the microphone, it's like, (laughs) that's what I'm hearing on the one side. So my other side now I'm trying to listen to things because again, as a performer, it's a key thing to hear things. I'm also covered in blood, my own blood. So I can't hear, I'm disorientated and I can't see. Um, The match continues. We're still firing on all cylinders. And there's a lot of times where I'm just like wiping the pools of blood out of my own eye, as well as I'm trying to get my equilibrium as well as I can't hear. And it just, I'm in pain. Anyway, match continues. If you see the go back and watch it, I posted clips or just go back and watch it on Peacock. Remember when Spike comes down, uh, Spike wasn't having the best day, and I think he was uh, in a bad place. Spike and Bubba almost go at it out there. Uh, Spike is yelling and cursing, and he's just pissed. Um, <laughs> and there, it almost looked like he was against the Dudleys. But I think he was uh, not too happy, one, that he wasn't on the show. And then, two, I think he was uh, drinking a little bit. So there's a big argument before. While, and I remember Bully just being like, because he had told me, like, they had, like, give me the friggin' lighter. So anyway, when they're doing this, they pick me up. And you could feel that flame instantly. And if you go back, it wasn't just a little bit of a splash, like I told you we did in rehearsal. He had two lighter fluid things and sprayed them up and it lit like an inferno and up goes dreamer down goes dreamer i did get a little burnt on my left side so my left side is really feeling it because that's the same side that i got hit on and i got burnt on my left side uh when i hit because you're above the flame and uh heat and fire travel up so that's where you're gonna get so it's not even when you hit it's you're getting the fire as soon as it's, you know, at its mushroom state and you're getting dropped into the flames of, as well as there's lighter fluid on it, which then the lighter fluid catches onto your clothes, your skin. And that's why you're kind of rolling around, uh, shaking, doing all the things that I was doing and place goes, I, I'm so happy though. Like the place goes nuts. Here's the last part of it. When Bubba dives on me, whatever air I had left is gone. And he also jacked my shoulder because he's trying to go for the pin, but the table's there. So we had to dive over it. And he's a heavy dude. Plus, he's driving down and in instead of if someone's splashing you or they're falling on top of you and you could brace for it. And it's, again, my left side. I can't hear him coming. I can't see him coming, so I can't brace for it. So, I mean, my shoulder was jacked. Then we have all this aftermath uh, going on. I remember rolling out and I want to, there's one picture that I've ever seen. I roll outside to the floor and uh, I'm just watching this all. I'm holding my shoulder. I cannot hear. And again, I'm bleeding and Beulah is next to me and if I could lead up to this, this is the first time my children are one little more than one and they have never been left out of our care. So my mom was watching them and Beulah did not want to be there. I always dragged her into it. And she was like, can I go home now? And I was just like, can you just watch? She goes, this is awesome. But like, I got to leave. When can I leave? Because she wanted to go home and take care of the girls, which is a testament to amazing 
mother she is and in the most endearing term of endearment and pure what any woman says to the father of her children she turns to me and says i can smell your hair and your flesh burning it's disgusting <laughs> and i'm like isn't this awesome she goes it is cool and then I was like, all right, you can go. She leaves. Um, I just sat there and watched it. There's a great picture. Uh, I forgot who took it of just her and I just talking, watching this all. But that's the actual conversation that we're having. And I know when I had her on this podcast, we talked about it. And um, it was something. Now the next day, it's now a Monday. So... I have to do things like I had to get some stitches, not as bad as the stitches in my head today. I had to get, you know, when you have a bit of a burn, it was the least burn, worse than a sunburn. But, you know, I had, I didn't have like needed skin grafts, whatever that degrees is. I don't know what the degrees are, but it was, it was pretty bad. And I still can hear when I'm getting sewn up as well as, and I love the doctor. He was my friend. He's like, hopefully you're here and come back. It's like you got your eardrum popped, but it didn't break. It should come back. Then he was just like, with your trauma, if the, because it was hot, my ear, it hurt to touch. And he was like, if this doesn't go away, the worst that'll happen is your ear will fall off. I was like, what do you mean my ear is going to fall off? He goes, well, the blood won't move. It gets calcified and it'll just fall off because you've had such trauma. And I go, well, what do I do? He goes, well, you can't sew it back. It's like dead cartilage. And I was like, so you're telling me my ear might fall off. He's like, maybe. I was like, oh, all right. But no matter what, I'm going to work the next day because this is a Monday. And Vince McMahon goes to work. Tommy Dreamer could go to work. And I wanted to make sure that they knew I went to work and I was bandaged up everywhere. I went to work and I'm going to show that one Vincent Kennedy McMahon that I too can outwork you Vince. I'm the man. I could be in the main event. I could produce every match. I could write the show just like you can. And I was ready. I was dressed to the nines walk in the halls like Vince McMahon walks when he does his entrance and guess what? Vince wasn't even there that day. They were doing something called Monday Night Raw. So I ribbed it myself. Um, and while I was sitting there, I was not feeling good. I did throw up at work. And then I went home. And But I'm going to tell you my other kicker for that day. And this is the bigger kicker. Because you remember things uh, so, such moments in your life and you remember it. That day I woke up. And I probably got home around 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I remember like talking to Beulah and uh, she was like, how did everything go else? Everyone was happy. Yeah. And I was like, how are the girls? And she was like, oh, they were great. Like they were asleep. There was like, and I was like, see, you had nothing to worry with. So the next day at about maybe 10 minutes to seven, I'm dead asleep. Like I said, I'm deaf in one ear, but my hearing is coming back. I'm burnt and I have stitches and I'm bleeding all over my pillow. And I'm dead asleep. And then all of a sudden the door gets kicked in like the police are here. Boom. And it's Beulah. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened? What did I do? And she goes, your mother cut the girl's hair. And I was like, wait, what? And she goes, your mother cut the girl's hair she gave them bangs and i was like and she goes look and she goes i found this in the garbage so she's like i'm calling her why would she do this it would be my daughter's first ever haircut um beulah was very very upset and <laughs> that was the last time my girls were ever left in anyone else's care my mom never was able to babysit my daughters again. So this great memory and this great night of man, I made it everything. My mom the next day uh, had it all taken away because that was the moment when I look at that stuff, I'll say, yeah. And around this time, my mom 
cut my daughter's hair for the first time. And Beulah was very upset, rightfully so. Uh, my mom never apologized. I have apologized still to this day uh, for it um, because your baby's first haircut, she had a kit and oof, did that strain that relationship, which was at times strained like it's always going to be. But at the end of the day, Beulah stepped up big time with my mom's passing. But these are all things that literally happened all within one 24 hour period of my life. And uh, just the build up and all that stuff. And there's just, there's so many stories out of this. Don't know if I want to do, I've had recently a few people ask me about an ECW only podcast. I do like interviewing people uh, for my House of Hardcore podcast, which I will have guests for us next week. But people have also approached me many times about an ECW only podcast because I saw Mick Foley talking about the 2006 pay-per-view. Um, but this was the 2005 pay-per-view and I was involved in the 2006, not as heavily creatively because of the direction they were going with, which that was a big Shane McMahon and John Lauren. I just helped put that all together as well as them negotiating with sci-fi, all that stuff. But that's for a podcast of another day. Uh, but that's what I was saying. And uh, the beauty of life, I've lived a great life. I've produced many, many moments. Those moments will live uh, forever, long after I'm gone. And if uh, you ever want to watch a great pay-per-view or a great passion project for me, and at that time, it had given me closure for that thing called ECW. And then they brought it back but that's a tale for another day. And this is uh, the House of Hardcore podcast and I'm Tommy Dreamer.